Welcome to New Mexico Black Rifle Operators Union. I'm your host, Sean. You know, I'm going to bring this story from Austin, Texas, because it kind of hits home to something I've been talking about a lot. You know, with the left going off on uh, gun buybacks. A uh, story comes out of Austin, Texas, where a cop got busted basically stealing guns. But it comes out later on that he's trying to preserve some historical pieces of history. Um, there were a couple of shotguns, and there was a 1911 from World War One that were turned in, and he got caught taking them. I'm a little torn here in that I'm not a law and order guy anymore, so I actually think this guy did something very wrong, especially since if you're going to sell a gun back to for anything, you should get more money out of it for one, because it's just a piece of property. Um, but this is something that I've addressed with the sheriff in San Juan County specifically because he's had to deal with gun buybacks not because he's trying to get them going but because there's been organizations that have come into town and just sprung them up in fact Shane actually went after them to try to uh, legally to try to get him prosecuted for obtaining firearms without following New Mexico law specifically the background checks that are required for transfer of a firearm so I applaud him for trying to you know, get down in the dirt and go after these guys that are doing these stupid things by taking out firearms off the, well, they say they're taking them off the fire, out of the street. They're not really taking them off the street. They're getting crappy guns off the street. And they're taking advantage of people, especially older people, who had something handed down to them, um, possibly when someone passed away, maybe a bring back from World War II that are historical pieces, or, his, you know, World War One even, in this case. And I'm really, really torn about this because, <clears throat> one, all guns by law are usually destroyed. You know, and I know of at least one case in New York where someone turned in an STG-44, and these are rarer than winter roses, period. And to have them turn in something like this that should be a museum piece and to sh- have to destroy it legally tears me up. Because there's a piece of this historical, you know, a firearm like this is this historical piece of, of evidence of what has happened in our world. You know, you may not like guns, um, but even now, there are guns, uh, not guns, but there are arms from the Middle Ages that are still kept and preserved to preserve history. To me, I see no difference with a firearm. Okay, you may not like them. You do not see gangbangers running around with STG-44s or MP40s. And if someone were to discover one of these in an attic and then turn it in, there should be some sort of recourse that says this has got some historical significance. And yeah, go ahead and give them their gift card, but don't destroy the firearm. You know, transfer it to um, someone else. Transfer it to a museum should be the course of action if they're not going to make it available for someone to purchase through an auction. Um, I know that lots of these law enforcement guys hold things like balls, whatever, to try to make funds for to get the equipment they need. Why can't they sell this, you know, go ahead and talk to the ATF because they're partner buddies. ATF sucks, but in this case, maybe have some sort of partnership we'll say that says, hey, we have a historical firearm that rather than destroy it, can we sell it to a museum um, to get funds to fund our department? Or can we get a transfer stamp from you um, because we do so much uh, talking to you and so many partnerships with you? Can we get a transfer stamp for this so that we could send it to an auction house and put another one of these historical firearms on the registry for available for purchase for the civilian population? Because these are rare you know, it, it's terrifying to me to see that this type of thing could have happened. And it's really shysty that it was a cop that actually was stealing these guns and probably putting them in his own collection, and that's probably why he got busted. But they should have been flagged, in my opinion, as historical firearms. You know, it, it, it would blow me away, but I could see it happening where someone turns in a single action army, a Colt single action army, that has low serial number that was in the bottom of somebody's basement or in their attic in grandpa's, you know, chest, 
and this is a historical firearm from when the West was being made, you know? And they're turning it in thinking they're doing something good, but they're depriving the historic... They don't understand the historical significance of the firearm, and they're depriving the American public and the public in general from a piece of history. You know, I am a huge fan of history. I'm a big history buff. Anyone who knows me, who's talked to me for a long time, you've paid attention to New Mexico Black Rifle Operators Union and you've tuned in. Thank you very much, first off. But you know I'm a history guy. And, you know, a second or First World War, 1911, to me, as much as the 1911s are around and you see representations of them, that's not as significant as something like that STG-44 being destroyed. Um, it's still a thing, you know, this should be a low serial numbered World War I gun is still a historical significant right, uh, pistol, and it should be preserved. And I understand the mentality, or the stupidity at least, of these people trying to turn in their firearms that they have no use for, they never use, they never know what they, they don't even know what they have, turning them in thinking they're trying to keep them off the streets from bad guys to have them. I understand that. I don't agree with it, but I understand it. You know, if if you find uh, drugs, uh, case in point, you know, my mother and my father passed away, and one of the things I had to do when I cleaned out their house to make it, you know, to, to turn it back over, was that I found unused prescription drugs, you know. And some of these were pretty heavy drugs, especially in my dad's case. Now, in my dad's case, they took those right away because he was in hospice care and they were there for end-of-life type stuff to just ease the pain. So they destroyed him right there on site. Um, they, specifically, they put him in kitty litter. Um, and it's gone. Okay, I understand that. I see no difference here if that's what they think in the firearms realm. You know, I personally do not believe that a firearm is that deadly as those prescription drugs. But if you have that mentality that I've got to keep the American public or the public in general safe, I understand the mentality. So I'm not faulting the people selling it as much as I am the guys receiving it because these guys should know better. Um, they're trained in firearms. So if you see something that's really unusual, you know, like that STG-44 or like that Colt, uh, 1911 from World War One. there should be some mechanism, whether you agree with gun buybacks or not, there should be some sort of mechanism that halts its destruction because these are historical pieces of history that cannot be replaced. You know, there are, if you paid attention to, to Facebook, I've gotten really into watching their reels and I found this guy who does restorations of World War II guns, or guns in general. And most of the time when he finds firearms, he's finding them from the Eastern Front. And how can I tell? By the type of weapons he's using, or finding. He's finding a lot of Russian weapons. He's finding a lot of uh, German weapons. But they're in such a decayed state that they couldn't have been brought back. And they were probably cast in mud, dirt. Uh, sand, everything you could possibly think of, snow specifically if it was the Eastern Front. And these weapons are not a dime a dozen. You know, I've seen them restore, uh, and when he does a restoration, he doesn't do, uh, the guys I'm talking about specifically on, on Facebook, don't do a good enough job of restoring them to make them to where they are shootable again. Okay, there's some of those cases that you see that they're pretty close to being shootable, but they're not quite there because there's parts of them that are pressure bearing that they're basically soldering over just to make it look good. But the fact is these guys are actually working to try to preserve them or at least attempt to. I understand that. I want the ones that are the shootable examples that we can actually keep in the library of collections so that our future generations can see these examples of what type of engineering, what type of metallurgy that was used in these types of firearms. You know, this person that I'm talking about on Facebook and why I'm, I'm convinced he's using uh, Eastern Front guns, finds. He's got to be a European because of this and probably Russian. <clears throat> um, 
is he's found MP40s in such decayed states that he had to weld metal, you know, basically metal flats um, to make patches for these guns. Um, the plastic is ultra decayed. He's had Walters, Lugers, um, a lot of Russian, uh, Mosin Nagants, uh, K98s. If you know anything about history, you know where those guns would be and why they're in such the state that they are. You know, after World War II, um, at the end of World War II, I should say, there was a huge rush to disarm the Nazis in every way possible with good cause. So much so that they would take machine guns out of aircraft and they'd throw them in water, just the biggest body of water they could find, rivers, whatever, so that nobody could use them again. In doing so, they destroyed a ton of history because you have to look at the armaments, whether you like it or not. Swift and and blinding violence has solved more good or bad in history than anything else combined you know there's a lot of technology a lot of stuff that gets involved in making firearms and just to see the the sheer amount of firearms and arms that were made to you know prosecute a war and to see them destroyed is heartbreaking now i'm not saying that everybody should have these but there should be a museum to at least examine these and see them you know, Ian from Forgotten Weapons gets to see a lot of these in, in museums. There are some of these weapons that he will never get to see and will never know the story of because they're only in textbooks because of this type of destruction. And as long as we allow this gun buyback type thing to happen, period, I don't agree with it. I don't think it's constitutional. Um, I think it should be that at least there's some sort of fail-safe for these, you know, historical firearms. You know, in that vein, what else has been going on in the 2A is kind of disturbing, you know. Uh, New York got a cease and desist letter, and why that's not distor- disturbing, but it was about Glock bans. So Glock has been, in pretty much any semi-automatic, they're calling it the Convertible Pistol Act, that they're trying to push out. And one of the national firearms uh, companies, or rights organizations, came out and said, hey, put a legal brief together and said, you need to cease and desist. I support that action. My question, and I've posed this to most people that listen to my podcast, and i pose posed this to you know, my friends and family. Where's the line? You know, are we listening to the law anymore? I mean, we're proving time and time again, just listen to the story I just told you about the the dude in Austin, Texas, that blatantly, he's a, he's a cop, and he blatantly broke the law, okay? Now, I understand why he did it, if he actually did it for the historical significance of it. The fact is, this is probably going to end up in his own collection, and that is illegal. You know, you're not supposed to get these firearms. He didn't pass a background check, so he didn't purchase it, he didn't do any of that stuff. I'm looking specifically at these historical pieces we need to keep, and I foresee the Glocks, and if they allow these bands to keep going, that's the same line of thought that applies to those also. You know, the 2A is the reason why our country is as free as it is, and why it's lasted as long as it is, in my humble opinion, because the government hasn't been able to get authoritarian enough to go door-to-door and to perpetrate these, or prosecute, let's, let's put it that way, prosecute these ways, these draconian measures, because they know that there's an armed populace willing to fight back. You know, that's one of the, my biggest pushbacks with this do-nothing republicanism that's going on right now. You know, they're the, the party of, let me just write a stern letter. You know, the law is the law. Well, is it? You know, I've talked about We have a convicted felon now that's running for president. And there's a lot of people that are going to vote for for Trump no matter what. Well, what's the difference between that and the poor guy that, you know, made a mistake when he was younger? You know, until you seen it recently with Trump, you were all for ending that person's normal life to where they're not going to be a normal citizen, but now you're okay with it. 
Well, should we not have some reforms? Because this proves, case in point, what most of us in the 2A who've been fighting this battle for the longest term that we've had, where we are trying to tell you in every way possible that these are our rights, you cannot get them. Are you not seeing what we've seen since the 90s, since the, you know, the 1968 NFA stuff started coming out? That this slippery slope that you think doesn't exist has always existed. And that if you give the government an inch, they'll take a mile, take 10 miles. And the worst thing you can do is give up your rights in any way, fashion, or form. Whether it's the 2A or your First Amendment right. You know, if you did not wake up during the COVID stuff and really see how the government can really affect every right you have by locking you in your own home and using those people, those law dogs, to go after you in places that aren't as free as Farmington, New Mexico. And you were locked in your house for months and had to have groceries either delivered to you or you were allowed to go just to the grocery store just to pick them up and just to come home. That's the government that did that to you. And looking back to you know 2019 when all that stuff started into 2020, you guys are forgetting it because you're not getting out and voting. A lot of you guys still don't think it helps or it matters, but it does. This is the last line of defense you have until we have to open that fourth cartridge box. And if you're not willing to do this, are you even willing to open the cartridge box? Because there's a lot of people right now that are asking that question, myself included. As you know, I'm one of those people that would hang just like our founding fathers would and be a felon if I was caught because I feel so much love for our country and those founding documents that gave us our rights that have allowed us to exist as long as the United States has. You know, our Constitution is a one-off. If you look at places that didn't have electricity and they've made their Constitution since, they're making continual errors. They're making continual authoritarian regimes. But ours was made before the, the founding of electricity, and yet it's so flexible of a document that such an invention didn't affect trade. It didn't affect way of life. That is uniquely American. And to see so many people willing to forget our history, whether it's a firearm or forget our history of how our founding country was founded, that's heartbreaking. And it's disturbing. Especially for someone like me, who, you know, I will fully admit I was a status at one point in my life for a long time. I'm no longer that way. Where's your line? Does history not matter to you? Have you not seen what happens throughout history when authoritarian regimes are the only ones with arms? Look at China. You ever heard of this guy named Mao? You know, one of the first things Hitler did was take away firearms from the average citizen because he didn't want them to revolt. It wasn't the very first thing he did. The first thing was he demonized a group of people and called them the other. Well, you MAGA guys, you're the other now. How do you like it? Okay. It's time to stand your ground, pick yourself up by the bootstraps, and say enough's enough. Like, share, subscribe, most importantly, be great.